hello and welcome back to this episode of Cat Side Podcast. Today we're here to talk about love. Think about all the different types of love in your life. There may be love for your partner, love for your family, love for your friends, and I think that many of us would agree that we love our cats. I know I do. But what about our cats themselves? Does your cat love you? All right, so before we get started, we need to define what love actually is. Love can kind of be one of those terms that is hard to pin down. We could define it as a strong affection for another individual based on close personal ties or an intense emotional attachment between two individuals. In all, love is something that can help us feel more safe and secure, especially when we're around that other individual. As humans, we're always trying to figure out how animals feel about the world around them, and we might even think that different animals have varying capacities to love. Is this something that you've noticed, Tori? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point that when we think of dogs and cats, we tend to have two very different visuals. There's these stereotypes that are associated with each one that culturally we have curated over the years, many, many years. Um, So when we think about dogs, we think about man's best friend, a partner in crime, helping us hunt and gather, all the way to helping us maybe figure out how to scent for coronavirus. Dogs are always known for helping us. But when we think about cats, their job started out as a mouser. They worked independently from us. They have this vibe and stereotypes associated with them that are that they're independent, that they're self-sufficient, aloof, and they don't require anything from us. But is that really true? I live with super affectionate cats. I know, Kristen, you have um, affectionate cats as well. And so how can we define love in terms of a relationship with a feline? I think that you're definitely right that there's this divide in how we view these relationships between dogs and cats. And I think one issue that we face whenever we're working with animals that aren't people, so animals that can't talk back to us and they can't tell us how they feel, well, we we can't really know for sure if they feel a certain emotion or not because we can't ask them. But what we can do is look at either their behavior or even their brain activity as a measure of those internal states or potentially feelings of love if they exist. So actually, one one study I'd love to bring up is not a cat study, but it's a study done with dogs. And something that we've mentioned in the podcast previously is there's not been a lot of research with cats, especially when we compare it to that done with dogs. So I would like to focus a little bit on dogs just because some really interesting research has been done with them um, that just hasn't been done with cats But have you heard of the study by Gregory Burns looking at the fMRI patterns in dogs? Yeah, I took a great interest in that study because I love how they trained them to sit perfectly still in the MRI machine so that they could get the best images that they could. Yeah, it's it's really amazing for people who haven't seen. The research was led by Gregory Burns and his team, and they have videos online of how they train these dogs to sit perfectly still. And if anyone has done an fMRI before, they uh, you know that not only is the machine itself extremely loud, so you have to really habituate the dogs to being around all this noise, but also you have to sit perfectly still to get the measurement. So um, these dogs were super well trained. That was Part of the challenge of the whole study was just getting them in that condition to be able to sit for a long period of time. And not only that, it's very expensive to do this kind of research. So if you have a dog that's not cooperating, that could be thousands of dollars you just wasted trying to have the time to use that machine. But what we mean by fMRI, that's that's functional magnetic resonance imaging. So what this means is that it's tracking the blood flow in the brain. So you can see whether blood moves from one part of the brain to activate another area of the brain. And what we can then do is present the animal with different things 
and see how their brain activity changes in response. They looked at one specific area of the brain, which was the caudate region, and the caudate is associated with rewards or pleasure. In humans, we see the caudate will activate in response to things we like, so food, money, or a loved one. And that's one reason I wanted to talk about this research is it does have some implications for what dogs like or potentially love. So in one part of the study, they trained dogs to make an association between two hand signals. So one hand signal meant that they were going to get a food reward. The other hand signal meant they weren't going to get a reward. And they saw, just like they predicted, that the caudate region of that brain, so that reward center, was activated when they saw the signal for reward, but it was not activated when they saw the signal for no reward. So after that, Burns took it one step further, and he presented dogs with the scent of either their owner or stranger. And what he found is that the caudate region activated in response to the owner's scent, but not the stranger's scent. And they've also um, done some preliminary research showing that the caudate region also activates after a brief separation with the owner, so once the owner returns. So again, this is showing that the dog is associating that owner with good things, with rewards, but not necessarily every person is associated with those things. So there could be some preferential behavior in response to that owner. And is this something that behaviorally you've noticed in your own dog, Tori, that when you return from a separation that Nikki is showing behaviors that might indicate she's happy to see you or that she's glad you're home, things like that? Yeah, she's a little bit different. Um, She definitely shows happiness and excitement when we get home, but she's a bit more of a complicated case because she suffers from some intense separation anxiety. So she's not alone very often, but when one of us does come home, she is very excited to see them. While we may not have the MRI data from cats yet, um, we do have behavioral research. Kristen, you worked on an attachment study with cats. So tell us a little bit how what the results were with that and what you saw. Yeah, so one really important thing too when we were looking at both things like the fMRI study and behavioral studies is we want those kind of to support each other. And that's what the dog research has done. The um, fMRI study is really supported by the behavioral research where when we see dogs are separated from their owners, there's things like separation distress until the owner returns. And then we see those greeting behaviors. The dogs, the majority of them, are able to go back to their normal behavior once their owner comes back and then go, go back to whatever they were doing. And so we looked at the same kind of thing in cats. So what we did was bring cats into an unfamiliar space, which was our lab at Oregon State. And we've talked about this before on the show, but what we're really interested in is how do the cats respond after the owner has left the room and then returned? And this is a measure of attachment. And so attachment, it's not quite love. Um, People will sometimes talk about it as love. But it's more looking at if that animal is able to use that person as a source of security. So what we see is often when the owner leaves the room, the cat will be distressed. So we'll hear the cat crying. We'll see that the cat doesn't continue to explore the novel room. They just kind of sit in front of the door and cry for the owner to come back. But once the owner comes back, we see there is a greeting. The cat will go up to the owner. We'll see they engage in a lot of affiliative behaviors like rubbing on the owner, purring, um, sitting on their lap. And most cats will then go back to exploring the room and toys now that their owner is back. So we see that uh, the cat is using the owner as a secure base 
from which to feel comfortable and to explore a new environment. And that's the exact same thing we see in dogs. In our research in our lab with dogs, we run the exact same test and we see the same patterns of behavior. So for both species, the human is an important component in how secure and comfortable they feel in different scenarios. So again, although we don't have the fMRI study to back up the brain activity in cats, we're seeing similar responses between cats and dogs on this kind of test. So I had been reading some materials from John Bradshaw and I saw a quote that I don't have a direct answer of how I feel about it, but it's something interesting to point out. So he says, cats are not born attached to people. They are born ready to learn how to attach themselves to people. And this kind of brings up the nature versus nurture debate of do ca are cats innately able to love people or do they learn through socialization and their early experiences to learn to love people? What are your thoughts on this? So um, that's a really interesting quote to talk about. And I think we don't really know, uh, to be honest. Same goes with dogs. Dogs aren't necessarily born being attached. If they don't receive proper socialization within a sensitive period of time, then they it's very hard for them after that period of time to be able to form an attachment. And we can see the same thing in cats, that they also have to learn that people aren't something to fear. Between two and seven or two and eight weeks of age, it's really vital that they receive proper socialization with people in order for them to have those positive responses to people later on. So I, d I definitely think that there's an experiential part of attachment, but I would also say that some of these attachment behaviors are built in because they're related to survival. So things, um, for example, think about if a kitten is separated from their mother and their litter mates. They're going to produce distress vocalizations. They're going to cry for their mother. And this is working to alert the mother that the kitten needs help and to also let them know where that kitten is located. So in all, this behavior is helping to protect the kittens from getting lost and also from dangerous predators. So some of these attachment behaviors are things cats are born with, but then maybe through experience with people are modified to be directed towards people instead of their own mother or other conspecifics or other cats. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I definitely agree. I mean, even if that little kitten, you know, who's alone in the nest is not distressing and the mother doesn't notice them, they're also missing out on those vital meals that they need to survive as well. Um, so I think from a survival standpoint, for a young animal, I think they need to show these behaviors, which comes out of necessity, maybe not fully from love, but the way that that starts to build in with their relationship with people over time comes from that innate behavior of, you know, meowing or vocalizing to get what they need, which we all know at dinner time, cats love to vocalize at dinner time to let us know that they're hungry. And this may be some sort of residual behavior from when they're younger. And this brings up the question of how our cats do view us. Is it a parental type love? What would you say to that? Oh, yeah. I think um, when we're looking at the relationship between humans and cats and also humans and dogs, the human is a primary caretaker. So they are responsible for that animal's you know, livelihood. They're responsible for feeding that animal, for protecting them, for making sure they're healthy. So a lot of the things that humans engage in with pets are caregiving responses. And so with the attachment work with both dogs and cats, we're seeing that the cat and dog also behave in ways that indicate attachment toward the person like a parental offspring attachment. And what we see in human infants is the same type of thing, that when the uh, 
the parent leaves the room, that they're distressed, they cry, they search for the parent. But then when they come back, for the majority of infants, they're able to calm down, they go and greet their uh, parents, they then return to exploring the room and exploring the toys. So we see the same kind of behaviors, which is, again, indicating that there is some strong affection that's allowing for them to feel safe and secure. But whether that is exactly the same thing as what we see as love between a child and a parent, we can't really say again. Um, But we are definitely seeing that these uh, traits of safety and security are something that's key to this human-cat relationship. When we think about these relationships, we're mostly thinking about the pet relationship and, of course, around the world that does change on how that looks. Um, But it's interesting to think about with feral cats or the barn cats or cats that we tend to keep in um, colonies or that have formed themselves outside. It's not necessarily in their best interest to show outward affection. because this can be dangerous for survival. So that relationship between the cat and the human can be different. What do you think about that? I think as far as free roaming cats go, it's interesting to look at the relationships that they have with one another as a measure of what maybe cats in general are capable of. More and more research has come out that looked at these relationships between cats and these colonies. And what they find is that cats prefer to interact with specific individuals over others. So what this means is cats had preferred associates. So certain cats that they like to hang out with and spend time with and certain cats that they just never hung out with. And so even though there might not be a human relationship between these cats, they do have relationships with one another. And in my own research that I did for my master's, we definitely saw this. We saw that some of the colony cats would always constantly be hanging out. They'd be sleeping together. They'd be playing with one another. And then some cats would show up for food, and that was about it. They didn't seem to have a lot of affiliative behavior with other cats, and they kind of just went off and did their own thing. So I think that, again, even without a lot of human interaction, cats are still forming affiliative relationships with one another. You know, there's this idea that cats are from a solitary ancestor and that they don't create these bonds. And so I'm so interested to see that there's more and more research claiming that they do have these bonds. They do have preferred associates and they want to be social with one another. Just like humans, maybe we don't want to be social with every single person we meet, but we definitely want to have those bonds and relationships Yeah, and I think this also comes to this idea, uh, we might have talked about this our first episode with the solitary versus social behavior, but cats in general have very flexible social behavior. Some cats really prefer their owner, some cats are very strongly bonded, whereas other cats may be less so. But I think one component of that that people don't consider is the human's impact on that. So how is your behavior impacting whether your cat wants to spend time with you or whether they bond to you or not? It's definitely a relationship. So when we talk about love, if the other partner in the relationship never shows any warm affection towards you, why would you have any warm affection towards them? I think that's a brilliant point to make. Um, And I think there's a lot of you know, bringing back the stereotypes, I think there's a lot of preconceived wrong notions that cats don't want to interact with us, and therefore we don't interact with them. And I think that's for for my per, my professional and personal goals for people is do stuff with your cats. I don't care if it's training, I don't care if it's play, just spend more time with them. They They do want to interact with you. And most of the annoying behaviors that you see are because that's what they've resorted to, to get attention from you. So if you just pet them more, and and I want to make a note about petting. Sometimes petting is not what your cat wants in terms of affection. Sometimes it's play. 
Sometimes it is just being near them. Sometimes it's talking to them. So find out what your cat's uh, sort of love language is. And I say that very loosely because we're talking about whether or not love truly is a thing in cats. But for all intents and purposes, their love language. Figure out what they enjoy from you. Um, maybe it's training. Maybe they don't want to be all next to you and cozied up and, you know, um, getting pet and kind of mauled by our primate nature. Maybe they want to be doing something for a reward. So find out what motivates them and then do more of that thing. have to remember that in different parts of the world there are different ways that we interact with cats so in different cultures there's different levels of involvement that we have with cats and what we expect out of them you know just a few hundred years ago we only expected them to hang around and kill mice for us and now all of a sudden we're expecting a companion and someone that's always going to be there and we're basing this off of how we look at dogs we're not utilizing them for our mouse um killing needs we don't have that we have mouse traps or you know whatever we do to prevent mice from being in our house and we also think it's kind of gross when they do get a mouse so we're kind of removing that identity from cats and we've assigned them this new identity of companionship and so now we have them in the house and that prevents a different welfare concern for them as well on um we stuff them in the house we give them new friends and we expect everybody to get along so we have to think about what they want in that relationship too maybe they need more space from that animal um or maybe they just want some downtime from you um, but it doesn't mean that they don't like you or they, they, they don't want to interact with you. We've talked about this before, but I love bringing it back up. You know, owners think if my cat goes out and starts hanging around the neighbor's house, then they don't love me because they're betraying me. They're going to someone else and trying to get the love, the attention, the food, whatever it is you know, that the neighbor is giving that may, how is, how am I not good enough? And we put this on ourselves. But when we think about a dog being social with someone, we love that. That's what we want. Most people want dogs to be. We want them to be friendly with others. So it's interesting how we put these constructs on these different relationships. What are your thoughts about the cultural differences and how that plays out? Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. Um, again, this idea that if a cat goes and gets affection from some person that's not the owner, that that's, like you said, betrayal. Because um, even in humans, when we look at attachment, we see that when when we're babies, when we're infants, there often is this preferential behavior that they often prefer the mother or the pr the parental figure over, you know, a stranger. And a stranger can even be something distressing to that infant. But after about 18 months of age, we see that they start developing multiple attachments. So it's, it's something normal to have multiple attachments to multiple people. And so having a bond with, say, your aunt is not proving that you don't have a bond with your mother or father. Um, and same thing goes with pets. It's a very healthy reaction to be able to be socialized to several people, not just your owner. And um, as far as culture goes, I think that's really interesting. If we expect, um, either based on what we believe or maybe our culture, that the cat isn't going to want to hang out with us or isn't going to be able to form a bond with us, why are we then going to try to interact with them? Um, versus if we think cats are capable of these things, we might be more likely to reach out to them and initiate those interactions. So I definitely think that how we view the cat and how we behave towards them is directly going to impact that cat's sociability and maybe also their ability to bond towards you. So there definitely can be a cultural difference between how people are viewing those relationships um, and, and, and also enacting them as well. 
Sure, absolutely. It becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you interact with your animal and you build that bond and you work towards that relationship and having a good relationship, you're likely going to have a good relationship or at least a better relationship than someone who gets a cat, likes it as a kitten, and then blankly ignores it as a piece of furniture for the rest of its life. There's probably not going to be as deep of a bond going there. And you're probably going to see either some problem behaviors or just nothing out of your cat because they're going to be independent in that situation. Yeah. And and another thing too is we, at least in the U.S., um, we are treating our cats and dogs very differently. So puppies, it's just kind of standard that you're going to take them to puppy class. They're going to be socialized. They're going to get training. But we don't expect those things from our cats. So we don't give them those experiences. But then we're producing animals who don't like to leave the house, who are uncomfortable around strangers. Now, is that because it's something, again, this nature versus nurture idea? Is it cats are just this way? Or is it an experiential thing? And I think last episode or, or... Two episodes ago, we talked about we're seeing that cats are capable of, you know, forming these bonds and they're capable of going out and exploring the world and it being enriching for them. So again, coming back to this idea, what do you expect out of the animal and how are you shaping that expectation into their behavior? All right, so this whole time we've been kind of dancing around this idea of whether your cat loves you or not. And that's really because, well, we just don't know. Even in humans, it's really hard to pinpoint if someone actually loves you. If someone tells you they love you, is it really true? And what does love mean to that specific person? Some people might say that they love you, but then they behave in ways that are counter to that. So even in humans, we know love through that person's behavior toward us. We know love when that individual cares for us, when they show us affection, and when they trust in us. And the same goes for cats. Although we cannot ask the cat directly if they love us, we can look to their behavior in order to determine how they feel about us. Just because we can't put the label of love on your relationship with your cat at this point, with adequate research, there are things that your cat does in terms of body language that shows you that they do have this bond with you and that they do really value the relationship. And so that's something that you can look at in your cat to see whether or not they're enjoying something in that moment. And just like in humans, you know, verbal language is only a piece of how we communicate with each other. There's plenty of other ways that we communicate with body language, just whether we're smiling at each other or moving towards another person or softening our body when we see someone coming up to us that we do enjoy hanging out with. And that's the same thing that you can start to look for in your cat to see how they're feeling in that moment. So some things to look out for are, you know, is your cat walking up to you with their tail up in the air? Are they walking towards you with some intent or are they slinking away from you? That gives us a big indication of what, how they're feeling in that moment. And I will say just, you know, in case they do slink, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, on the opposite hand that your cat hates you. It's just that they're feeling a little unsure in that moment. Um, But tail up, um, resting close to you, um, bunting, which is that headbutting behavior, that all means that they're coming up to you um, soliciting attention. And so give it to them. So does your cat love you? Well, science might not have an exact answer just yet, but from observations of cat behavior, we can definitely see that owners have a special place in the lives of cats. Cats look to their owners for guidance. 
they can form strong bonds with their owners, and they can be highly social and affectionate toward their owners. Just like I hope to be a source of comfort and security to my cats, my cats also provide me with comfort when I'm feeling down. They cuddle me when I'm upset or sick, and they're there for me when I have a bad day. I may not know if my cats scientifically love me, but I can say for sure that I love my cats. So we've gone into the nitty gritty on whether or not cats feel love. So do you think cats love? What do you think that looks like? And how does that impact the relationship between you and your cat? Let us know in the comments. We would love to continue this discussion and hear more from you guys. This episode was brought to you by Mao Eyes Cat Behavior and Space Cat Academy. Visit us online at maoeyes.com and spacecatacademy.com. <laughs>